Не так сильно газуй. Чернигов's being bombed relentlessly. We're with a convoy taking in aid and hoping to reach those still there. This is the last route in or out, and it has to be done fast across an open farmer's field where every vehicle can be a target. The city is surrounded on three sides by Russian troops at this point, and there's a stream of cars ferrying the civilians out of the combat zone. The window to get across the last remaining pedestrian bridge across the Desna River is rapidly closing. But the Russians have spotted this escape route, and minutes after we arrive, they hit it. Okay, the shelling is very close. Get out, everyone's gonna get out. He said get out, get out, get in, get in, get in, get in. Get in from here. So no, I don't I don't it's okay, don't worry, don't worry. There's a mad scramble to get out as the attacks keep on coming. Alright, go, go, go now. Go, go. The Russians have used this tactic repeatedly in this war. The last, the last thing they want to do is have an accident. Lines of civilians lay on the ground as the shelling goes on and pick themselves up to walk through these bombings. They've no option. Only chance and a prayer will get them through this. There are scores of people trying to flee with bags on their backs. They're guided through the fields by soldiers whose guns are no match for this heavy artillery. They've been living without heating, food, water or electricity for weeks. Everyone, come and go from this way. The Russians have cut off Chernihiv now and destroyed the only corridor out, and they're targeting those trying to escape their bombs and rockets. Inside Chernihiv, the mayor has managed to film some of the destruction. There are bombed houses and buildings on fire everywhere. There are still an estimated 150,000 people trapped inside this city. It's strategically important because it stands right across the northern route chosen by Russia for its advance on the capital. We cannot cope with all the dead, the mayor says. It's carnage. We take refuge in a gym in a basement with a group of volunteer soldiers. Everyone who has made it out of Chernihiv has withdrawn to nearby villages, themselves coming under bombardment. This gives the volunteer soldiers time to make phone calls home. One month on, fighting this war, their families and children are mostly well away from the chaos and death they're seeing here on a daily basis. My heart is just breaking, one father tells us. It's very difficult because I'm so used to being with my family. They're my whole life. Away from their own families, they're saving the lives of others. How important is human life, another says. What could be more important than the lives of little children, little girls and boys? Nothing's making us do this. This is just what we have to do. Daybreak the following morning and they're trying to work out how to get aid into Chernihiv and the civilians out. The last route has closed and is clearly still being targeted. One paramedic asks us for help. He's Yuri, and he tells us the bridge crossing point where he was waiting to help casualties has been shelled 15 minutes earlier. Now he is wounded. He's been deafened by the blast, it was so close, and he's got several shrapnel wounds. Bits have lodged in his leg, and he needs surgery. There's little that can be done on the roadside, but one of our team does what he can. Where from you? British. British? Yeah. And shrapnel appears to have punctured his lung. He says he's finding it hard to breathe. Targeting of civilians and non-combatants like medics is a potential war crime. I went there all on my own, Yuri tells us, and I saw destroyed cars, destroyed civilian cars. They were all burned out, they were completely destroyed, and there was one dead civilian with his bags. Okay, guys, good luck. Yeah, good luck to you. He leaves to try to get to a hospital with this parting message for the world. I need our country, need your help. Good luck. Nearby, a farmer's field has been littered with the remains of cluster bomb rockets fired from a multiple rocket launcher. 
We've consulted several independent experts, including the investigative group Bellingcat, who've identified them as cluster munitions. They're being used by both sides in this war, but the angle suggests they've been fired from Russian positions. The United Nations is investigating the use of cluster bombs as possible war crimes. From inside Chernihiv, they fear they're the next Mariupol. They're trying to create as big a humanitarian disaster as possible, one Chernihiv official tells us. Because they can't get the city militarily, they're trying to force us to give up this way. There are constant sirens warning of attacks on the surrounding villages. And those desperate to leave know every movement comes with risk, including the buses taking them out of here, which they patch up hurriedly. This was hit when it was full of escaping women and children. Chernihiv is really being hit by tank fire, being hit by jets, he tells us. Some people haven't been able to get out for two weeks. Those who've made it out talk of a nightmarish existence. It's hell there. It's hell, this mother tells us. My children's godmother is still there. It's not possible to leave the shelter. There's no food, no gas, no electricity. It's just like Mariupol. Everyone's cut off. They're distraught and terrified. Chernihiv used to be so beautiful, she says. The rituals of death are crammed in between the shellings as those left behind struggle to live. For those here, this isn't real living, it's just surviving. And those trapped in Chernihiv cannot know how much longer they can hold out. Alex Crawford, Sky News, outside Chernihiv.